Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm pleased to present my first, uh, for the first time in front of Council today, and I will be talking about the snow and ice control policy and some proposed revisions um, that I'm recommending we make or that we administration is recommending we, we take a look at. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Yeah. Uh, okay. I think what I'll do is, if it's possible, to run through the, the policy or the presentation first. It's about nine or ten quick slides and then um, try to take some questions after yeah. that. Maybe some of the questions will get answered as I'm sure. running through. Sounds good. So I want to start by reading the actual statement out of the policy. So the town of Canmore strives, or the town of Canmore will manage snow and ice in a manner that strives to provide safe access for users of the transportation network and public facilities. Snow and Ice Control, or SNCC, will focus on accident and loss prevention, facilitating emergency response equipment, mitigating against economic loss, and delivering service with an environmental and sustainable conscience. So that's directly from the policy, the proposed policy. So the purpose of this policy is uh, centering itself around accessibility for users on a prioritized basis. Uh, the policy will provide stakeholder guidance for operations, administration, general public, and outline service expectations within each service category. So to give a little background and history on the current policy, I tried to pull a picture sort of when the last policy was, was, was done. But, <laughs> so 2002 was the last time the policy was, or was when the policy was drafted. Um, and we govern our snow and ice control by policy. Uh, times have changed since since 2002, obviously, you know, with respect to things like multimodal shift, population growth, changes to the infrastructure in town, um, we have independent service delivery and strategies for roadways, active transportation systems, public facilities, um, and we have a different ideology around environment and sustainability. Uh, third thing I want to point out is that the snow and ice contract, or the, the, the snow management contract for our streets and roads, which is currently in place with Volker Stevan expires July 31st this year, so it's important that we have a policy in place uh, that we so that we so we can send out to RFP that that they can um, have as they build their their um, bids. So getting right into the key changes with the policy on the left, the the gray graphic just outlines how the the current policy the focus is about roadways. So roadways kind of that's how we prioritize based on. Uh, roadways. Um, the new policy or the proposed policy would bring in the concept of active transportation, that's the transit, public transit, pathway systems, bicycles, uh, laneways, um, and also public facilities. We have a lot of public facilities that are accessed by the general public, like this building, uh, EP, for example. So addressing that within the policy as well, I think, is important. Uh, highlighting the key changes, I'm diving a little further into that. So I've got two, two centimeters in 24 hours. The current policy, which is governed by roadways, like I say, is, is five centimeters and plowing to begin within 48 hours. So what the proposed policy would say would be that we plow after two centimeters and um, with, within 24 hours after a snowfall. So this, this is reflective of industry standard. Um, we've also standardized a response across roadways, active transportation, and public facilities. So different, e each one of those categories has three priority levels. All priority ones would see two centimeters in 24 hours in terms of response. Uh, the proposed policy would generalize facilities as opposed to specifically state actual facilities in the policy. The current policy has specific facilities in there, some of which are obsolete or being used differently. Um, the proposed policy addresses emergency accesses uh, and also addresses snow emergency. So building, build, giving us the ability to create an operational strategy around a snow emergency. We address that in the policy. Um, <clears throat> there's some snow removal discretion with some of the parameters in there. Uh, we, we bring an environment and sustainability uh, focus into the policy. I've suggested five-year reviews, or administration has suggested five-year reviews, so that we can have a consistent look on a, on a regular interval to make sure that we're consistent with what we're delivering. And it, t it brings in Town of Canmore stakeholders, so I've, you know, things like the integrated transportation plan um, would be a, a good example. And we've got complete streets, um, pathway systems that 
th that has all been factored in to the proposed policy. Getting into some of the financial impacts, just want to talk a little bit about the underlying facts with, re with respect to finances and the, and the proposed SNCC policy. Uh, snow seasons are highly unpredictable and highly variable. And SNCC categories are unique. So it's not just roadways. Like I say, we have active transportation and, and public facilities that I think we need to address better. We manage them differently as well. So roadways is managed by private service, a contracted service, and we manage pathways, et cetera, in-house, in the streets and roads department, and public facilities is typically managed by whoever is in that public facility. So this building would have a responsibility attached to it for clearing around the, the sidewalks and plazas. Uh, looking at the financial impacts for roadways, um, this is, these are budgeted and actual numbers from the past five years. And what I'm highlighting here is the variability that we've seen um, with respect to snow over the, over the past five years. Uh, cost changes for a new, as we go out to RFP, it, it's, it's difficult at this time to comment on um, some of the variability we, we might see or changes financially might see based on how these bids come in. It's, it, it's difficult to predict at this time um, and until we send it out with new policy and new expectations. When it comes to the active transportation systems and public facilities, uh, we've tended to adapt to change since 2002. I mean, equipment functions better. Um, processes have just kind of developed over the years to uh, bring these systems in, and we still respond with the current policy, but uh, we have adapted well to change. The current, in saying that the current budget supports the operations or the changes that, that are being requested or proposed in the, in the proposed policy. And I think improving parameters will enhance the operating efficiencies and our ability to deliver across departments and, and monitor and quality control contracted services. And with that said, I hope everyone saw the Simpsons episode of the Plow King. <laughs> Mr. Plow. That was a great slide. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I'd like to just open it up for, for questions, comments. Thanks very much. Um, just, just one thing that I picked up on in, in your verbal presentation was the suggestion of a five-year review on the policy. Is, is that actually in, within the policy? The, I don't think it's in the policy, though, is it? To, to in, the, in the proposed policy? Yeah. The there's this, I'd have to find the section here, but there's, I made a comment in there that we, that we review the policy every five years. Okay, I just couldn't see it on a quick I can page. find that for you. It's, it's in the scope section, so section four. Section four. Last uh, sentence. Right, thank you. Councillor Comfort. Uh, yeah, thank you. On the um, previous slide to this one, which by the way is excellent, um, improved parameters that enhance operating efficiencies. Can you give an example of that? Okay, I, I'm new to the streets and, super, streets and roads supervisory role, so um, my second day we saw 40 centimeters of snow, which is <laughs> you know, just a coincidence. <laughs> so, um, it was a, what it was, though, was a good example of uh, sort of seeing systems go to work right away. And uh, my immediate observation was I think systems could be better and improved better. So. Um, if I can just, I, I brought a couple of extra slides. So when I look at, uh, this is straight out of the policy. So this is the prioritized levels within active transportation. So in the streets and roads department, we, we respond to active transportation. So improving the uh, parameters would be to, on the, on the right, that's a map of all our path systems and it's got our equipment, specific equipment designated to specific pathways so that we can identify which was best used in which area, that way I can help train operators to use that equipment and there's a better understanding for where we're supposed to go. Um, same with bus stops. I've been working with Rome Transit to integrate and prioritize what their mm -hmm. uh, top priority bus stops are. So this is what I'm getting at when I'm saying like, if we know better, um, if we are, are better trained and better prepared, we should be able to respond um, even by bringing the, like the two centimeters in 24 hours versus five and 48, we should be able to respond just by being better prepared. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Heal, for your presentation. Um, you did great for your first one. Thanks very much. Um, 
I'm just, when I, when I first read this, um, the current policy has that you'll respond after five centimeters of snow within 48 hours, and then the proposed revised policy would say respond after two centimeters of snow within 24 hours. Does that not imply that there will be a service level increase? No. If you're responding quicker? No. Like we've, what I was trying to get to in the slide that says we've adapted to change. Like we tend to, we tend to be delivering a service that is reflective of that already. And that's based on better equipment. Um, there's a reasonable understanding of where we're supposed to be going. So I think that's just bringing it more in line to what is actually happening. Right? So you've already been doing it to that standard? Yeah, to a degree that, that has been adapted. We, we have adapted to that. Maybe if I could just add something. Sorry. Uh, since the policy was added, what we're talking about specifically are the priority ones, which we didn't really have before. So that was public transit and really not an emphasis on wheelchair ramps, for example. So we have evolved to that, and that's what we're resourced to do, and that's, what we're, that's why we're not looking at any budget increases to reflect this new policy. Okay, so <clears throat> um, the other question I had for you was about handicap parking stalls um, with snow removal on those. Right. We had heard some concern from the community that the snow wasn't being removed quick enough. Are we on top of that now? Have we put some I mean, new processes? We, we were, to be honest, we were without a greater operator this winter, and that was something that we will not have this winter. Um, I think planning and uh, training for, for that capability is, is something we're working towards. Um, just doing a better overall job of curb to curb, including uh, handicapped parking stalls. Is so is that where that comes in with the curb to curb parking? Mm -hmm. What, what uh, priority would that be? I believe I have that in, in the first one. In the, so in active transportation, it would be that's part of the active transportation? So, well, I guess I, it's not part of the, uh, for parking lots? So, that so would it's a, not specific, but that's where it would fall under? Right. So that would be under in, in public facilities. Um, parking lots would be a priority three at this point. Okay, thank you. Councillor Comfort? Uh, yeah, I just had a question. In the written materials, it says the old policy lists, lists specific materials for de-icing, and then the new one, it doesn't specifically list products to allow for, for operational discretion and to trial new, more sustainable products. So I just have a question about that. Um, if we know a product is inimical to human health or that sort of thing, we wouldn't even consider using it, right? No, right, and th that's why I wanted to kind of generalize that a little bit more so that, you know, if we explicitly state something and it gets banned, I mean, there's no amendment that needs to be made. I wanted to have that operational um, sort of maneuverability to try new stuff, try environmentally sensitive stuff, and to uh, eliminate things and not state them that, that, we're, that that's what we're using. I just thought it was a more appropriate way to address what we're putting on the roads. I think that you're right. Pardon me? Uh, I said I think that you're right. I'm glad to see that. So, thank you. Just uh, on that same point, um, what, what's the usual practice or how, how is it decided to use uh, de-icers rather than sand? I mean, you, you know well, that there's like abrasives we, and de-icers. Yeah, so we would pre-wet with de-icers, so before a storm, following forecast, we would like pre-wet hills, corners, right. you know, problematic areas. And then sand would be a response that would, you know, the snow has now started. Sand is, is uh, like an, an, a response to put abrasives down on the road that de-icers aren't really going to do the same thing at that point. Okay. Um, and, and another question just to make sure I understand what you're talking about in, in the first page of the report. You're talking about uh, in efficiencies being supported by prioritized response tactics, improved mapping, and enhanced uh, telematics. Can you just tell me what you mean by enhanced telematics? So that would be uh, fleet GPS systems, or um, right now we're going to RFP with a new telematic system, so GPSing our equipment, so we should be able to see where equipment is. When it comes to managing or quality control controlling a contracted service. Um, we can follow application rates for what they're putting out. 
currently what we do is we basically buy a stockpile of, of, of inventory and kind of chip away at it through the year. You know, it's, it's a pretty, it's a paper-based tracking system, whereas we think we can do a better job of that with, with uh, you know, digitally monitored uh, application of, of whatever they're putting on the roads. That'd be an example of, of that. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing where they are is another one. Right. Uh, if they're down, we know they're down. Um, you can billing according, like uh, reconciling billing with, with what they've actually done, with you yeah. know, figuring out how to use that telematic system to be more efficient with quality control. And the telematics are installed on the contractor's vehicles, right? The, yeah, they currently are. And, and that's part of the agreement that we will have, or we will put that in the RFP, that that's a requirement. And it, Volker Stefan currently does that anyways. They don't have a problem with it. They have their own telematic system, but uh -huh. I mean, we're not administrators of their telematic system, so we require them to use ours. Hmm. So. Okay, thanks. Councillor McCallum. Thank you, Your Worship. For, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Hill. Um, I noticed in the uh, briefing report, there's a list, and you showed it before, the list of the budget items for what we've spent mm -hmm. and what was budgeted. Those numbers are different every year. How do we make a determination as to how we budget for that year? <laughs> how does that black magic work? Uh, w whenever we create a budget, and uh, we would usually <laughs> try to do a four-year rolling average so that we made sure mm -hmm. we had adequate funds in there. And that would help explain the variance if it did need to go up or, or not. So there's no farmer's almanac involved? Uh, no. No. <laughs> no, surprisingly not. Yeah. Perfect. And um, is the proposed snow clearing um, policy in line with the bylaw that applies to the public in terms of their own sidewalks in front of their own properties? Does this that does bring it into in line with that. Perfect. So I thought it was important to bring those kind of, take mm -hmm. out some of the confusion there. Like priority ones are across the board, uh, a certain expectation, two centimeters in 24 hours. It's also industry standard. I mean, everywhere appears to be doing the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, our snow systems aren't that much different than Calgary, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I wanted to bring that, the effort there was to bring that in line to be more consistent. So yes. Perfect. Um, and when you showed up on your second day of work and there was 40 centimeters of snow, how many hands were there on deck that day outside of our contractor? Okay, so contractors would deal with the, like, I just want to make like sure the outside contractors of Volker. deal with Outside of Volker, yeah, okay. how many hands on deck were there from? Okay, so this is yeah. part of what I think we need to do a better job of with mm -hmm. snow emergency. Like, it, I think it's important in the policy to address snow emergency and state some parameters that we would use to build a strategy around responding to that. Mm -hmm. And then part of that strategy operationally would be to, um, you know, and I've done some of this through, the, through this past winter, would be to who are our contractors? What equipment do they have available? What, who can, what are their, what are their rates, rate sheets like? Can they be called upon? Is there an expectation that we can um, use them? So th that communication is being established. And then it's a matter of refining and doing a better job operation. So, and I guess I don't even understand. Mr. Fully. Hill, so sorry, could you just actually speak sorry. into the mic? So we have our own staff through the town, through the Streets and Roads Department that go out and deal with the snow. Right. And then we have a list of contractors that are in landscaping or whatever that we also call in. So do you find it difficult when you're competing for those folks and um, like all of the other property management that they have to do <clears throat> in the community to respond to the public bylaw, like to the bylaws regarding public property, say for condominiums and things mm -hmm. like that? I think you definitely can be exposed to that. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of trying to get some, you know, a preferred list and, and get that conversation going, just mm -hmm. like any, any uh, property management company would. Right. Some of the property man management companies would have their own equipment. Uh, that, is, that is a challenge and it is, you know, building that operational strategy to, it, building that into an operational strategy is, is important. I always mm -hmm. wonder that because you see like when we have a huge dump of snow mm -hmm. and you see the property management companies out there and I know that we hire some of them to do the work <clears throat> at the town too, mm -hmm. how that competition, where that sort of inherent yeah. tension is and competition. And I mean, they're doing the same thing. Like yeah. they're, they're getting their guys on, I don't know if there's retainers being paid. I don't know how it works. They offer $30 roads, an hour for snow shoveling. Yeah. That's what you see yeah. online. So and I send my 15 year old out so they do that. <laughs> And that day, for example, in-house, it was sort of all hands on deck. Yeah. Parks was, 
I mean, it was, that was a bit of a special circumstance. It was day two and everyone in public works was basically when like, what can I do? you see the admin assistant from the engineering department out yeah. shoveling snow, you know it's bad. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, I'll let Councillor... I think that was all my questions. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Seeley. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Heal, for Thank the you. presentation. Thanks. It's uh, interesting and very good. Uh, I have a couple of questions about ice control. Uh, I noticed on, uh, in the policy itself it states that you can use uh, straight salt from time to time. How, uh, how often would that occur? Can you see, you saw what being used from time to time? Uh, due to extreme weather conditions in the Bow Valley, Chinooks and or freezing rains, straight salt may be used from time to time. Where are you in the policy? Uh, I'm uh, on page uh, 23 of the councillor report. That's the old policy. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then, uh, is that still in the new policy? No. Uh, that the concentration is like a. It's like it's about two thirds. The concentration is, I think, two thirds salt to. Okay. Well, that's uh, non-organic. It's a good improvement then. Yeah. And then uh, the second question I had uh, a few years ago, we had really bad ice problems. Uh, some of the some of the streets. And uh, there's an icebreaker out there. Is there, uh, is there an opportunity to partner with another municipality or access to an icebreaker? Should we need one in extreme conditions? I would have to source these areas, and I'm, I mean, working collaboratively with 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 another municipality, I think is appropriate, and I would do that. I, I'd have to source out what that equipment looks like and under what circumstances, and, and chase that down. Yeah, with climate change, it might be something we want to be aware of, anyways. Right. And right. Thank you. Just a question for understanding in, in section A, roadways, priority one, the removal policy, the snow removal occurs when accumulation of plowed snow impedes traffic and on-street bike lane access. So what are you thinking when you say impedes traffic? Okay, so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the, the current policy states uh, that we remove snow. So what I'm getting to there is the removal of windrows or snow that's piled into the middle of the road. Um, current policy states that we would remove that when we get to 100 centimeters in height. Um, 100 centimeters in height is quite <laughs> wide at the bottom. It, it's not realistic based on the way we're now building some right. of the infrastructure. So Spring Creek has you know more of a complete streets design. Um, so the change there was to create a set of parameters that will allow us operationally to go in and you know, assess the need to remove snow. So um, are, are, is, is safety a concern? Are the, are the bike lanes accessible? Can we, you know, that's going to be long before on those roads, long before 100 centimeters. So mm -hmm. I was trying to establish some, you know, to give some operational discretion because it's not like that for every road. I mean, Pallister Trail might be different. But the, the intent is to, um have it in place that, that the wind rows can be removed earlier than perhaps under the current right. policy. Right. Great. I think that's I think that's supportable. <laughs> um, in priority three on the same section under roadways, the removal no snow is not removed from snow is not removed from priority three routes under normal normal circumstances. And in the old policy, it, would, it notes that uh, the snow removed from the street. Visibility, how does that, how was that worded? Removed when street visibility to ve vehicular and or pedestrian traffic becomes an issue, which I don't actually understand that direction. Um, not that I have to, but in, in the new policy, snow is not removed from priority three routes under normal circumstances. So can you imagine uh, abnormal circumstances that would then uh, have you put a crew there to remove snow from priority three? Right. So this is exactly why I thought it was important to put in some spe special considerations for each one of the priority levels. So I mean, you know, if we have emergency situations, we would go into South Canmore on a road that never gets, gets uh, plowed, for example. Um, we don't have the situation where police, fire, and hospital are on roads that aren't being plowed, but I mean, we would do that if, if that were, the, were to happen. Um, if there's a public safety concern for accessibility, 
we would go in there and do that. Uh, the decision there is primarily, I think it's budget based. I mean, we've got what we, we, we can spend what we can spend and we need to prioritize as best we can, which um, tends to have a certain, uh, there's going to be a priority three in there. But we still want to be able to have some operational discretion to say that we would go in and, and clear if we had to. So leaving the policy direction fairly, I don't want to say vague because that's not what I mean, but some room for some objective discretion. decisions, discretion, yeah. right? So obviously normal circumstances would imply our normal winter conditions. So priority three routes shouldn't expect to have the snow removed in our normal winter conditions. That, shouldn't expect that. It. Right? Correct. Maybe I just Except, and then beyond normal work, uh, snow uh, event conditions would be if we had a, a priority three section of road that had, you know, we experienced 15 centimeters of snow, uh, or let's say five, uh, we wouldn't be going in. Wherever else we would be going. But then two days later, it's another five. And three days later, it's another five. So over a 10 day span, okay. they've received 30 centimeters of snow. It's difficult for their vehicles to even get out of their road, we would certainly be going in and, and, and providing uh, uh, some snow removal in there. Great, thanks for that. Uh, I think the last question I have is uh, from the second page of the uh, new policy. Uh, it's the first bullet under section B, active transportation. So it's talking about pathways uh, that have typically have an asphalt surface. And I'm remembering last winter, maybe two winters ago, when there were difficult conditions on, on all of the trails. And there was uh, some suggestions from the public that we should be out there sanding or something, the uh, gravel pathways, because they were treacherous for cyclists and all, which we can't do. I appreciate that. The suggestion was made that maybe the town could have boxes of sand out there and residents could hand sprinkle sand on the particularly icy uh, sections of those of those trails that we'll never go to or get to. Is that uh, something that could ever be uh, initiated or? Well, we'd, we'd, I mean, we put boxes out uh, in areas around town. I don't, I'd have to, we'd have to chat, but I mean. Yeah, we do have uh, probably about a half, and do half a dozen boxes that we put out there, but it's primarily to do with road sections that are slipperier. Um, so if I think homesteads, for example, I know there's one close to my home. The, st the approach into the community is on, an ang is on a decline, and, uh, right. and so people so have the opportunity there. But to do it on the, the trails, what I think would be much more difficult to do, you'd have to have them dotted all the way along. And the delivery of the material to those trail locations, I'm guessing would be problematic? Yes. Is equipment based, if we have the equipment to do it, but we would have to look at what we have and how we would get it in there. So effectively that would be an enhancement that would have to be addressed at budget time. Right. Because there would be. You'd have to take a look at what, what that might cost, yeah. And one option that administration did look at is because those trails are so packed with different, you know, wheels and footprints of uh, packing it down. So go over with a, some sort of motorbike that's winterized or a snow, snowmobile, for example, pulling a weighted trailer that can try to make the, the, uh, the walking surface more even. Okay, thanks. Did you have something there? Um, yes, uh, thanks, Your Worship. And, and maybe Mr. Heal, um, just to clarify then, if I, I could add to the mayor's comment is that under priority two active transportation pathways refers to just paved pathways then so gravel pathways are not considered a priority two right it's an equipment you know an equipment issue so typically uh, paved pathways asphalt covered pathways so is that clear in the definition i just think in order to, for clarity we, we would right. want to make sure that that's that's clear. So in the definition section under pathways, it, that's, it's defined as such. It's paved. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members of council? Seeing none, thanks very much for your report. Thank you. And I know this is coming.
to the next council meeting for discussion and voting. So we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Mayor Council. This time I'll move back to item D1, the Peaks to Prairies Southern Alberta Electric Vehicle Network Update. Ms. McClatt. Good afternoon, Your Honor and members of council. My apologies for the confusion around this, but I'm we got it thing. sorted out. Hey, you just elevated me to the status of a judge. <laughs> <laughs> Your worship. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes <laughs> it happens. <laughs> I can be judgmental, I get it. <laughs> Sorry. So this report uh, for council information, and my apologies for not having a fancy slideshow for you today. Um, we have been working for about the last year with the Peaks to Prairie uh, Southern Alberta Electric Vehicle Network Initiative, and uh, Councillor Sanford, you might remember that uh, this was discussed uh, in the Calgary Economic Partnership when it still existed um, and has been progressing forward. Um, they have received great funding in order to implement the Peaks to Prairie and essentially it comes down to connecting uh, rural and urban communities through an electric charging station network, uh, allowing both rurals um, to have access uh, to charging stations in a, a wider range of communities. Um, so the charging station will be located uh, in the parking lot adjacent to Miners Hall and available for public who seek to charge their electric vehicle. So this network is a partnership uh, with, sorry, the Alberta Regional Economic Development Alliances, the City of Calgary, the City of Lethbridge, um, and other communities in between. And it's a fully funded initiative. Um, this fits well within the Town of Camber Climate Action Plan, which sought to enhance the electric charging network within Camor. And uh, since there is no capital cost, it uh, was a great opportunity for us to partner uh, on this, uh, this project. We have been working with engineering, planning, facilities, um, our sustainability coordinator and economic development in order to figure out what the best process is around this. Um, the process required the town um, or the communities that were identified within the network um, to meet the following criteria. So the land had to be publicly owned. Um, there needs to, needed to be access to sufficient power supply, so closer to a generator. Uh, optimized co-benefits to the community, so close to proximities, easily accessed from main travel corridors or thoroughfares, and an opportunity for cultural branding. Uh, so the site was selected in partnership with multiple departments to understand uh, what would have the minimal impact on the already um, limited parking supply within the town of Camor, but have the greatest uh, benefit as well to meet those criteria. Uh, to add the installation would add to the electric charging stations that are currently in the town, one by Arts Place, which is a level four charger. Uh, Rocky Mountain, uh, the Camor Rocky Mountain Inn has, a, has eight level three, which are Tesla vehicle only charging stations and Petro-Canada has four level three charging stations um, available, so it would expand. Some of them, uh, so Arts Place is for free, uh, and the rest do require a fee for services. The agreement, uh, the installation and the maintenance and the customer service around the installation, the contract for that was given to ATCO. This was a competitive bid done by the Peaks, Peaks to Prairie initiative and the only requirement for the town would be the land and to make sure that like we do all of our parking lots it would be cleared of snow uh, when required after 10 years of operation there's a license of operation <laughs> agreement uh, for 10 years um, so all the costs for the installation would be on the peaks to prairie and we have an opportunity after 10 years to either renew or cease 
uh, that uh, operations. Any questions? Thanks very much. Yeah, I have uh, two um, questions. The first is why would why would the plan not be to um, install two of the fast chargers rather than I mean the the slow charger seems really slow. So why wouldn't we put two of the fast chargers in? Um, that's a great question. I think it has to do with the overall budget of the of, of the project. Uh, this was funded by the Feder Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the Government of Alberta, and the funding was received. And in order to install uh, the entire network, they had to balance out some of that cost. So ideally, and of course, uh, we have the opportunity if we say, you know what, we would like to see that upgraded to put those costs. But currently, in order to do this as a... Uh, free installation, uh, that's uh, what they were able to provide. Do you have any idea what the cost would be to upgrade the slow one to a fast one? I don't at this time, but I can find out yeah, that information. I'm thinking about the use of, of those chargers, and most likely they'll be used by travelers, people mm -hmm. driving through the valley. And uh, the slow charger, if I understand this, charges a rate of 20 to 40 kilometers for an hour of charging. So in order to, to, to charge the battery, it's going to take a really long time. And if you're a traveler trying to get from Calgary to Vancouver, say, or something like that, I don't see how that's going to work. Fair enough. On the other side, if we locked them down in our downtown for four hours, our hope is that they'll spend some money and have an economic impact. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, okay, anyways, I'd like to know what the cost of upgrading to two Absolutely, fast chargers. Absolutely, I can get that to you. Thank you. And uh, one other question, just around the management of the stalls. So presumably they have to be left um, unused by normal parkers. So Correct. how are we going to manage the use of those stalls? Yeah, it would be no different than, for example, our electric charging station that we have currently at... Um, uh, arts place that stall is designated for that use uh, mm -hmm. at this time but in this location on our busy weekends which are becoming more frequent and and that parking area is like slammed people are gonna they're gonna pull in there and park and just then they disappear and then the stall is well that's what I'm asking how are we gonna manage the use of that you know, that's a great question, and I don't know if I have a succinct answer. We looked at what would generally have the lowest impact and not require more impact on other stalls. And this one, because it has a bit of a, um, a gravel area in between the lots, it made sense uh, so that you didn't have to take up a third lot to install the, 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 um, the charging stations itself, and it's close to a uh, power generation. So. Uh, we looked at about five different locations in town, and that one uh, de was deemed to have the lowest uh, amount of impact. Did you have something to add to that? I, I did, thank you. We can also, bylaw is already doing parking enforcement all summer throughout the downtown core, so we can ask them to, when they're doing uh, parking downtown, when they're doing their sweeps, that to just sweep through that location once this is installed, and include it as part of their rotation. I don't think it's unreasonable for them to be sure, able to Sure, no, do that. I appreciate that. It's, but once somebody's parked there and goes off to do something for yep. six hours, that charging station's blocked, and maybe they get a ticket when they get back to their car, but still. That's, that's what we'll be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you for your presentation. I was intrigued by the terminology of range anxiety. <laughs> um, electric vehicles, electric vehicle owners have range anxiety because they yes, need to get from charger to charger. Um, is there an app that actually catalogs the chargers yes. across the province? Yeah, there are a number of apps, uh, one by Tesla and some generic ones that will highlight them and uh, these will be added to that so people can easily find where to charge, that I will also tell you if it's occupied or if it's free. Oh, okay. So, oh, oh, wow, uh, that's good. Okay. Um, and the ones that are currently in private 
ownership, those are at hotels, and Correct. people are expected to park overnight at those? Is that how that works? Yeah. Or, yeah. And they're paying for that service through Correct. the hotels. You also mentioned that Tesla was looking for the opportunity to put some more in Canmore? No, this, they have uh, They're already. seeking a partner. Oh, yeah. okay. And so that would be a private enterprise, again, Correct. much like the hotels? Correct. And because it's Tesla only, it's only their vehicles that can park there. Okay. These are more, would allow other makes of cars to access them as well. Okay, so the, the Teslas are specifically, would our stations charge a Tesla or not? Yeah, oh, they, they would. could. Okay. Um, are they interchangeable? We don't discriminate between brands. But they're, but so they're, are they interchangeable, the charging stations? Or? Um, I would assume so, but apparently uh, because it's highlighted as Tesla, uh -huh. I'm also going to assume that Tesla has a uniqueness to their charging, but they could also be charged at others. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Comfort. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, hello. Question about the um, uh, difficulty of monitoring that parking space being mm -hmm. properly used. Because it will be new, mm -hmm. can we not put one of those new signs up that draws people's attention to the fact that it's there and that it's that might help the proper use of yeah. it and also could be a promotion for our climate action initiatives? Absolutely great idea. I think there's some uh, some of that in the works. Uh, they're starting later this week in, in kind of preparing the site uh, as well and then ACO is required to do some signage around that as they oh, build and develop. Uh, and so we'll do some uh, marketing and promotion around that, but that's a good idea. Great, thank you. Councillor Mira. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you for your presentation. Um, with these lots, I'm, sh I'm assuming you say lock them down for four hours shopping in the downtown core. <laughs> um, do we not want maximum use? So. What would be the maximum, would you say, to charge a vehicle? Should it, should it be like so a four two hours? Hour? Is the it maximum is? that uh, the level two would charge, level it's three charges within okay. 30 minutes to 80% capacity of the battery. Okay. Yeah. So I was just seeing it, like, if it charges faster than the four hour period, then they should be moving on so someone else can use that spot. I guess it's it's how we outline that. Mm -hmm. So if we uh, put on the, the, the use, and mm -hmm. if that's a requirement, we can absolutely do that. Mm -hmm. That once charged, they have to move on. Mm -hmm. um, or if it's a parking spot, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from members of council? See none, thanks very much for your report. Thank Good you. Good information. Moving on to item D3, the Affordable Services Program update. Ms. Gilchrist. And Ms. Brown, and somebody else. <laughs> no, I'm she's just. Got my stick here, getting, getting me sorted out. Huh? <laughs> she's got my presentation on the stick here, okay. getting it sorted out. And I've got the glasses on, glasses off dilemma at my age. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Should I put them on or should I take them okay. off? Yeah. <laughs> I need some bifocals. Yes. All right. Thank you, Your Worship, and members of Council for this opportunity to uh, give you an update on the Affordable Services Program. Uh, the Affordable Services Program is a coordinated community response that provides eligible residents with increased access to supports aimed at making Canmore a livable place for people who want to make this their home. So in uh, March of 2017, FCSS launched the pilot, uh, looking for uh, a six-month period to try and hone the criteria, the eligibility criteria, the opportunity to make sure that we were screening and getting the people that we wanted to support who wanted to stay in the community. Uh, we learned a lot during that six months. It um, was a lot of talking and a lot of deciding and a lot of unique circumstances and cases that came before us. And we really wanted to make sure that whatever we landed on for the long haul was something that we could apply consistently to all members of the community. So uh, it took a lot of resources, to be entirely honest, of all of us batting it around. But I think we landed in a place that we're now in a position where we consistently know when somebody walks in the door that the proof of the uh, various things that we need from them is applied consistently and that we know that we'll never be sort of in a position where somebody says, why did you give it to them and not to us? So I feel really like we landed in a great place with the program after that uh, original pilot. 
So that eligibility criteria has, has sort of landed in the last year or so uh, with income thresholds of $31,200 for single adults and double that for families or um, couples. So that's based on somebody working $15 uh, an hour, 40 hours a week. Essentially, that would be what their um, income was. We also require three months residency in Canmore, so we look for people to provide us with um, bank statements, leases, uh, three months worth of job, driver's license, something that says, hey, I live here, um, I have a residence here, and then also status in Canada. So in that first pilot, we realized we were getting working holiday visas. We're not being screened out with our original process. And they weren't trying to establish themselves here. And in fact, we could support them to do some further travels to other places. So we now see people's permanent residency card. We know that they're tied to an employer. So if they have a closed work visa, uh, visa and they're working here for a period of time, we have access to all of that as well as Canadian citizenship. All right. So. What people are eligible for on the Affordable Services Program is, a, like it's, I said, a community coordinated response. Some of Town of Canmore services and some are services from other agencies. So within the Town of Canmore, uh, people have access to FCSS workshops, financial literacy, volunteer income tax program. Those are key pieces to this. That being said, we do assess folks uh, during the process, and if Meals on Wheels would be something that was valuable for them, we make those additional referrals. From the Recreation Department, Elevation Place membership and campership are products that are attached to the Affordable Services Program, as is bylaw um, with pet licensing. Outside of the town of Camor, transit, both local and regional, and right now we're on free local for everyone, so depending upon where that lands in the future, it may just be regional, but um, certainly in the past we've been seeing a lot of demand for the local transit. Arts Place is an active participant in Affordable Services Program, as is the Canmore Library. Kids Up Front is a, a very cool program out of Calgary. Primarily, they do have a little bit of BAMP Center stuff that we um, helped forge that relationship. But when there's pro um, sporting events, performances, theater, concerts, that people have season's tickets to or tickets that they can't use, they give them to kids up front. And we're able to, f to fan those opportunities out to all of our affordable services families. And we've had folks go to the opening game of the Stampeders and things like that where uh, they wouldn't normally be able to participate at that level. Canmore Eagles Hockey is a participant, Pine Tree Players, and the Canmore Seniors Association. Um, FCSS also spends approximately 15 to 20 minutes with folks. So we tell them how to access those services, what services are available to them, but we also spend some time building a bit of a relationship. What else is going on for you? If you're a new Canadian, did you know about settlement services? What kind of supports could they offer you? If you have young children, are you connected with Bow Valley Parent Link? Those types of things, so that we do a lot of additional information and referral through the Affordable Services Program to things that aren't necessarily a part of the project. Yes. So, currently on the program, we've sort of leveled off uh, participation at about 700 or 844 folks, 313 single individual adults, 54 couples, uh, 67 dual parent families, and 71 single parent families, and that number was effective at the end of April, I believe. Do you mind if we interrupt with questions, or would you rather we wait? Sure. I'm happy to wait. <laughs> No, I'm happy to You're take a, a question. Are you on a roll? I could be on a roll. <laughs> I'm happy to take a question. You just uh, you, you suggested that we've leveled off at that yes. number. Yeah. Is it your sense that um, that's, we've leveled off there because that's the need? Or is there a possibility that there's people that would want to participate that still don't know about it? or? So... Um, 
it's a couple of things. We started off with the big bang, right, that it was quite high, and it did include those working holiday visa and a large portion of that. So when I say leveled off on, in some degree, it means those folks are no longer there, so that really massive number I don't think we'll see again. That being said, we continue to see about 15 people a week in our office uh, related to affordable services. And so of those 15, there's a percentage of them who are there with their new set of taxes because we've just got our notice of assessments back from the government and they're renewing if they still qualify. So we're seeing renewals. We're still seeing just between two and three um, people a week of new participants on the program. Some people, this leg up or different employment or their, whatever their situation, they no longer qualify. Um, so I don't think necessarily we've captured everybody we'd like to because we see we continue to have people who've lived here for a reasonably long period of time who are coming in who didn't know about the program. But I feel like we're, um, we're probably not in a massive growth at this point that we see some falling off the one end, moving or no longer qualifying and a continued new coming in the other end. Thanks. Okay. Alrighty. So, um, we were able to, when renewals started, that very first year that we did it, we made the renewal start on June 1st because although we launched the pilot on, in March, what we found was in March you don't have a notice of assessment for current finances. That your notice of assessment is from a long time ago. So we put everybody's renewals June 1st with the expectation then that moving forward in year over year, you would have to have the most recent financial information attached. We were able to track and do some feedback and we continue to do that, uh, collect feedback on the various services and the supports of folks who are coming in for renewal. So that's what this data that I'm gonna share with you is. We've had 241 people or, or forms filled out with renewal that represented 427 people at the time that I pulled the data. I have to say there's a stack of another 100 or more renewals since the end of March. Um, those people represented, 29% of them were single adults, 28% parents, 32% kids, and 11% couples. When you compare that data to the data for the for 844, people that are currently on the program. It's not exactly the same, but it's fairly indicative that we can use this feedback, um, that it's quite aligned to say, yes, this is sort of a good sampling of the picture of what's happening with the affordable services program. It's also interesting to note of all this, uh, of these folks, that 12% were um, new Canadians, 8.5% were seniors, and that we had a significant number of single parent families. 84 families are included in that and 48 of the families were single parent and 36 dual parent families. When I was compiling this data from the feedback forms, there was a couple of surprises for me. I'm not sure I still know why uh, the data is what it is, but I was a little bit surprised. And the first thing I was surprised with was the number of years living in Canmore. So it's interesting, right? 77% of people lived here either less than five years or more than 15. Mm -hmm. And only 23% land in that middle stage of six years to 15 years. So we know that a lot of the 15 plus um, are young people who grew up here. They've lived here a long time, they're trying to make a go of it here. And we know that a lot of people are in that early here and trying to also earn not a lot of money and see if they can establish themselves in a positive way here. So I will be curious to see as we have more long-term impact of the PAH builds that we have, of affordable services program, of the things that the municipality is doing, that we have more of the low-income folks reflected in that six years to 15 years category. I don't know whether we will or not, but it struck me odd as, a, as an interesting statistic. The second surprise that I had was that the income levels were 
exceptionally low, even in comparison to the thresholds. 74% of all respondents were under $35,000 a year. And of the families, single and dual parent families, 52% of them were under $35,000 a year. I don't know how they manage. All right. Um, then we, they were asked what they accessed and what really made an impact. So 83% of participants accessed membership at Elevation Place. The library, which is now free for everybody anyways, but while it was still um, part of this program, 72% of people accessed the library, 63% local Rome, and 43 Arts Place. Those were the big four. Uh, I do have to say, although none of the FCSS individual program pieces are in there, what we have found is we used to have to cancel financial literacy classes or run them with two or three people, and now we're running them at capacity. Uh, the individual supports uh, to come in and ask for financial literacy in a one-on-one -on -one have increased as well. The volunteer income tax program where people come in we ask them for their notice of assessment, they don't have it done, we can help you get that done. And so last year, we were just shy of the million dollars uh, coming back into the community uh, through the taxes done through the volunteer income tax program. So in 2018 tax season, we instituted a lot of capacity build where we're offering workshops, we're offering one-on-ones to teach people how to do their taxes, that we're not gonna have the volunteer capacity or resources to continue to do it for folks, and if we can help them build capacity to do their own, we're um, having an even greater impact than if they continued to come back to us year after year. So we've had to sort of um, make a little switch to that, and I think a positive switch we maybe should have made anyway, but this program sure brought it to light that that's required in order to maximize our resources. Just one moment, Councillor Comfort, you have a question? Uh, just a quick question. Had you thought of recruiting from those people that you've taught those skills to teach those skills to other people? Not yet, but that's a great idea. There you go. <laughs> Not saying anything else for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> Shut my phone. Yes, we're just trying to hone in on the right programs to actually teach them because what we get from CRA is something that's used in the volunteer program and it's not something people can access somewhere else. So we've had to try and figure out how to, to actually teach them on a program that, that is something that they can access outside of the town of Camor walls. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the referral, food bubbled up again um, in that place where it wasn't really an affordable services um, program, but when we talked to people and told them about different services, they reported back that 41% accessed Food Recovery Barn, 26 Food and Friends. So they, food were the two highest um, access services outside of formal affordable services, followed by Job Resource Centre and Bow Valley Regional Housing, which was huge to us because we wanted to know if that investment of the 20 minutes or the half an hour that we were spending with everybody to build relationship, to make those referrals, were they accessing it or were we spending time that wasn't actually being utilized in the advancement of folks in trying to make CAM more livable for them? Councillor McCallum, did you have a question? I did on that previous slide, um, Ms. Gilcrest. It, so you're saying that 21% of the uh, people within the ASP are clients of BVRH? Or they've investigated, or they've, or they've looked, looked into at, it, or applied, or any of those or things. On the okay. List or, All right. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. They're just self-reporting. Yeah. So we asked outcome questions as well, and the two outcomes we were hoping to have is that you were better able to meet your finances at the end of the month. And so, very happy to say 99% of people said, as a result of participating in this program, we are better able to meet our financial goals at the end of the month. That's huge. And the second one is um, related to being connected to community and fully participating and feeling like a part of the community. So, as a result of the Affordable Services Program, they've met, reconnected, or formed relationships with people and 91% of people agreed or strongly agreed with that as well, with 9% of people who that social connection was not a result. 
So I feel really strongly that we've, I think, landed on a really good program that's achieving what we intended when we first came before Council to ask for support for this program. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So there's been a few financial impacts from the program. It costs us in time about 16 and a half thousand. I think that's where we've leveled off with this 15 people a week and the side, you know, and the data entry and all of that stuff. But it lives about there for us. We've waived fees in 2018. And it's been really impactful in some of those programs to have people who never would normally have been able to participate to get some real growth. And we've certainly seen it in some, some kids. Even just this weekend, they were up at Spray, a group, and one young lady who does live in Bow Valley Regional Housing, after the end of her Wild Little Women and the camping trip on the weekend, those were the best two days of her life. And she's lived in Canmore her whole life and never been camping never been camping, so it was kind of amazing, right, mm -hmm. that we were able to have her participate because she didn't have to pay. Um, ArtSpace, they are funding about 15,000 in workshops um, for both Banff and Canmore affordable services programs, and then between two and three, they don't keep track exactly of um, thousand in performances and theater, movie theater. Um, Sounds like uh, that the Discover Arts Fund is healthy. It's a healthy fund, it's a growing fund, and they feel really fortunate as well to be able to be supporting as many people in the community as they have been. And at Elevation Place, it's very difficult to know what the financial impact is after that very first year where we used to have old rec fee assistance data and affordable services, we've been in it too long that those are no longer comparable pieces of data. So it's unclear whether they have new members who never would have been members paying a discounted rate and in fact it's gained revenue or whether it's lost revenue for people who would be paying full price who are now paying a discount. What that looks like, don't know, but 16% of their membership currently is receiving affordable services rates. I want to end with a quote. This was the one that got me, although I do have to say one woman told me that Rome, local Rome transit changed her life. This one where it was like that we too, as low-income people, finally feel like we might belong here too. Pretty, pretty huge. Alrighty, thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, thank you for the presentation. I had one question myself. Um, I remember at a previous presentation a year or more ago, you noted that at that time there was one or perhaps two businesses that were taking part. Is, is that changed? So when we've had interest from business, we sat down and had a few of those long chinwag conversations I talked about in the pilot and came to the conclusion that we are happy for businesses to promote if they would like to, that they'd accept an affordable services card and provide um, a discount, but um, that we weren't going to promote business through the program for a couple of reasons. And some of those being the cost of some of the stuff that would be given a 10% or a 15% discount when at the same time we're trying to teach financial literacy and managing credit and budgeting were not necessarily aligned in messaging. So we're happy that anybody who contacts us now, what we say to them is, that is awesome. We're so glad you'd like to support your community. Please, by all means, advertise that you would accept that and that you will give it a discount. Um, but we're not actively trying to differentiate about what businesses we would like to have and which ones we wouldn't, because we want it to be that sort of fair level playing field and a consistent messaging when you're earning $25,000 a year of how to budget without at the same time saying, oh, by the way, go here for dinner and get 10% off where really you probably shouldn't be going there for dinner. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Thank you. 
I just, I, I do feel the need to challenge that, intending no disrespects, Tara. I do think there's also a, uh, and I'm not saying this happens in SCSS, but it can happen that there is a judgment that, that communities can lay on people based on income. And I think we're walking a very slippery slope with that kind of messaging. For me, I think what's important is that uh, it's a choice for businesses to make and the promotion of their inclusion in that is up to them. That's I think there are times when people need a latte um, to feel part of a community and, and they should get one um, if that's what they need. So I, I, and I guess I'm seeing this also from volunteering with campaigns like Christmas Spirit where it's very easy to fall into people who are in um, a circumstance where they would like some support that doesn't mean that they can't ask for or have nice things. So I think what's important is that businesses need to promote their inclusion themselves and then we provide financial literacy and people make decisions from there. Right. That's and sort of I the am, end of it. I'm not, I, don't, I didn't mean to imply I that know. we don't think that. We just, it was hard to decipher the messaging, the messaging mm -hmm. and to feel like we were being consistent in our messaging. Sure. And so that's our business messaging. Yeah. And I appreciate the, the, the dialogue and, and I, I agree with um, what you're saying. I, I was more curious whether we'd uh, actively promoted the possibility with, you know, the downtown businesses or any business sector. We haven't done that, no. Yeah. And, you know, maybe that's something we could consider. Certainly through the fall, uh, Lisa Brown and myself have talked about a number of things that we want to look at and that, um, that it may include additional things such as that, given your suggestion. Um, but also just in terms of thresholds and, and um, the livability versus affordability and all of those things. We're going to spend a little time digging in with living wage numbers and all sorts of different things uh, to just look at is there something more different alternate that we should also be uh, pursuing in the next year to two years. Thank you. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Ms. Galchrist, for your presentation. That's amazing. You've done amazing work. Like Thank it's, you. That program's come a long way from what it was perceived to be at the beginning, and now it sounds like you're actually reaching the people and supporting them. Um, it's a whole team of awesome ladies down yeah. in CSS. I can't take the credit. Well, it sounds like it's going in the right direction. Um, how long do people generally stay on the program? Do you have any idea? The, uh, the program is eligible for a year, and then if their income is remains eligible, then they would stay on the program. Okay, typically. so do you have any idea of how many people reapply? Do well, people come and go? In the first 10 months, we ended up with 241 um, members, and we'd had over 900. Okay. Yeah. So the 241, is that who's, who filled out the survey? Yeah, okay. and representing over 400 people, but it was oh. actually with couples and families and kids oh, okay. not filling them out. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there some potential to get more information about those people who are the 15 plus? You mentioned that some young people move back to the community and they grew up here, so they're calling themselves 15 plus. Is that? Yes. Did I understand that? Are those people? Or they're still here. Or they're yeah. still here. Are they living with their parents? Do you think? Some are and some are not. Okay. So that would be an interesting thing to know. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know how you would reflect that information, but if they're living with their parents, then they are being supported in other ways because they're not necessarily paying rent, but they're maybe, maybe my son they, pays yeah. rent. <laughs> yeah, but I mean that's a different situation if yeah. you're in a family environment and and you're earning a smaller amount of money, but your living expenses might not be as high. Just as yeah. an example, um, if. Uh, those people come in with a CRA notice of assessment and it's like old? Yeah. Can you use it? No. Okay, so, so it has to be the most... let them know it's the wrong year. Okay. Tell them what they need. Ask them if they've got it in process. A lot of times they bring in what they actually submitted to the government, not realizing what a notice of assessment is. Oh, okay. Um, and so we can help them with that. We also did some workshops helping people get their My Service Canada account so that they can access it online and have everything available mm. to them there. Great. And if they haven't proceed, uh, pursued anything, then we refer them to Mavis, they book that appointment and come in with their stuff and we do their taxes for them before they can apply for the program. Okay, so you, have, you help them get the most current 
um, yes. notice of assessment before you... And sometimes it's eight years worth of oh, notice yeah, of yeah. assessment. Oh. Well, it's really good to teach people that yeah. level of responsibility, right? So yeah. that's fantastic. I congratulate you. It's great. Thank you. Councillor Comfort. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Um, so the threshold is 31,000... 200. 200. For a single individual. Yeah, and double that for... For yeah. a couple, for and then for a family, is it double as well? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so a family with kids, they would have more expenses. Presumably, we would assume presumably. they have more expenses. Do you accommodate that at all? So this is a fascinating question because Lisa and I were just talking about that. The double the single was related to um, people living together who one person was earning a lot and the other person was earning nothing and they were qualifying as an individual. So we had them have to come in as a couple, and then it became um, this double the single number. But that in our financial look over the fall, that is the one piece where we feel like we haven't done a good job of differentiating families from couples, and whatever recommendation we come forward with, that differentiation will be reflected there, because that's come to light. Same question for me is, that doesn't add up. Right, it solved one problem, but maybe um, families need to have a higher income point than couples. Yeah, I think kids cost more in general. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Councillor McCallum. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, it's funny to see how this idea from Councillor Krauser from years ago has kind of come to fruition and then that realization remember that article we read about the number of uh, benefits that are left on the table from Canadian citizens yes. because they don't do their taxes yes. so uh, I'm glad to see that we're opening up that um, those taxes uh, services to all of those people as opposed to just seniors um, because I really think people are afraid of their taxes in a lot of ways they're afraid of doing them they're afraid of what it means how am I going to have to pay, especially if you've got eight years worth, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you can uh, tell me, are we still working with food supports in terms of, did I miss that in your presentation? There was a time that one of the um, benefits of the affordable service program was some assistance with food supports. Yes, we are. Okay. We do still have that. We... Um, we're very discerning because we do have a limited pot with that. I know. So we don't necessarily advertise it on things, um, but we assess it when we have those conversations. Right. And so this would be there outside is some of funded food, bank, food support. Uh, this yes. would be outside of food bank access yes. as well, correct? Christmas Spirit has provided us with right. grocery vouchers that we administer via the yep. program, but we don't have the level of vouchers for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's about extenuating circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's about those one-offs where all of a sudden you've been evicted and your new rent is gonna be higher. You don't have the, you got moving costs, you've lost your job, your interim. It's so more of a we reactive have those service. Kind, yes. And it's not necessarily tied to the affordability services Correct. program. Okay. Primarily it is, um, but it's difficult because we could have the whole thing gone in the first month if we aren't oh, discerning sure. about it. Yeah, so, for yeah, sure. we do. And we also have food bank emergency food hampers Yeah, when um, that isn't available to somebody or they've exhausted that or they're not qualifying for affordable services but have extenuating circumstances and the food bank hours aren't open. We have hampers in our office at all times. Gotcha. And um, my other question, and I think I might have lost it, it had to do with food as well. Um, is there any uh, a response at all through our local grocery stores uh, outside of the 10 and 5% Tuesday that's offered um, during the month to provide further discounts uh, during the rest of the month? That's not something I've ever pursued. Mm -hmm. Being that FCSS isn't supposed to specifically do food or basic needs right we're able to participate in food conversations when they're funded elsewhere or when we're doing a community development piece but that is certainly something that I will um, plant in Megan's ear as mm. part of the food alliance to take to that table 
mm -hmm. um, and see if, if there is, and if not, if perhaps there's an avenue for the Food Alliance to pursue that with some of our local grocery. Excellent. And I just want to say I'm really happy to see those FCSS programs being very well attended. I've always seen them as, I've wanted to attend some of them myself just out of special interest, but I see that they're growing, especially the Wild Little Women and um, the Healthy Little Chefs programs that are really great for kids. That would have been great when I was a kid. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Councillor Comfort just reminded me of another question I had. You showed us a statistic of um, income under 35000 mm -hmm. but your threshold here is thirty one. Yes, two. I have those very specific numbers as well. Oh, okay. Um, so just why did you include 35000 as opposed to just what your threshold is? Um, that was when I lumped everybody together. So when we look at the single adults that are... Um, only eligible up until 31. Mm -hmm. Their income here shows that. So that below 15 per, uh, 15,000 is 25%. Between 15 and 25 is 43%. And then 32% of the single individuals land between 25,000 and 31 too. That bigger statistic was sort of taking it for, from a whole bunch of people who actually could qualify up to as high as 62 were o only earning 35. So they were, um, they were grouped in $10,000 windows in order to correlate the data. So are you thinking that there's a gap between 31.5 and 35 or not necessarily? No. No, so 31.5 is the right level. It's the level for right now. I don't right know now. what the right level is okay. as we look at median incomes and we look at living wage and all of those things. This, this threshold is far below the living wage mm -hmm. threshold in terms of um, that calculation. And so and that's right good. now it's uh, serving a good chunk of our population to do what we want it to do. And I think we're going to dig in and look a little bit more if there's something different or different thresholds or different things we should And that's a $15 an hour job at $40 a 40 week. 40 hours a 40 week. 40 hours a week. What's the minimum wage now? $15 so an hour. That's where we're targeting. Yeah. And it could change with the when new government. When we first made right. this threshold with council um, in that working group, um, it wasn't the, min the minimum wage then. The minimum ha wage has gone up since then to the $15. Right, okay. Okay. Yeah, trying right. to understand these numbers in different scenarios is interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions this time? Seeing none, thanks very much for being here to report. And uh, thank you and, and your whole team for the work you've been doing. It's an excellent uh, program and it really speaks directly to livability of Canmore, which is part of our vision. So. I appreciate all that, that you're doing and look forward to just continuing to see improvements or uh, more opportunity through this program. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. This time we'll move into D4, the verbal report on car camping on municipal lots. Ms. Brown. Good afternoon. So hello, Mayor, members of Council. Thank you for your time this afternoon. I'm here today to give you an update on overnight camping on municipal lots, uh, specifically on the lot behind Save on Foods and Beside Elevation Place. So just a bit of background first. Uh, in May, uh, Council approved short-term parking restrictions on the Council lot, on the municipal lot, I'm sorry, beside Elevation Place and behind Save on Foods. The parking was restricted between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. The intention of the parking restrictions were to provide clear times so we can do enforcement. Um, and we also to allow people to rest overnight and to allow our short-term parking spaces to be available during the daytime. Prior to May, we only had limited information on who was staying on the lot. We knew that some individuals were on vacation. We knew that some individuals were storing their trailers. We knew that many were working and living in the, on the lot. And we also knew that the lot was used for individuals who were in need of affordable and supportive housing. 
We were unclear at the time the proportion of individuals in each of these groups and their needs. At the time of the May presentation, the number of vehicles of the lot in the lot were growing and it was clear that we needed to do something. There were examples from communities such as Squamish where the number of vehicles during the summer months had grown beyond the capacity of the municipality and as a result there was significant environmental damage. We also knew that in order for us to create longer term recommendations or uh, come up with different solutions, we needed to know who was staying in the lot, what services and supports were needed, legislation implications, and related costs. And to do this, Council approved 25,000, or up to, I'm sorry, 25,000 for an outreach worker uh, and related expenses to connect, um, to connect individuals with resources and to collect information on demographics. So after Council approved the parking restrictions in May from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., uh, both FCSS and Biolab began to connect with people on the lot to share information, to connect them with resources, and to inform them of the changes. What we heard is that people didn't necessarily need access to more resources, they simply needed a space to stay. We also heard that many of those individuals were working within the town. In June, the gravel lot was graded. Parking signs were added that stated no parking between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m., and we began enforcement. What we've noticed is that there has been increased parking availability during the day. That many people still park at nighttime there. They come in uh, usually in the evening. When I go there around 10 o'clock at night, that's usually when I see people going through. Uh, and that there were more vehicles in neighboring business lots. Also in June, we hired an outreach worker, Travis Reynolds, who's right here, and I'll introduce you to him very shortly. But before I introduce Travis, I'm just gonna share with you some of the work that Travis is gonna be doing with us during the summertime. So Travis was hired to collect information on demographics and to provide resources, and he works very closely, or we work very closely with the FCSS team, so if there are any resources that are needed, we go to the experts. So based on the work that Travis has done to date, we will be moving three surveys forward. First is a business survey. And with this, we want to know the impact on businesses. So we're working with, um, with the Manager of Economic Development, uh, Ms. McClett, on this, uh, just to know that we're asking the right questions. So we want to know um, if businesses offer or can offer staff accommodation. Have the recent parking restrictions impacted them and impacted their resources? Do they have staff who are struggling with housing? This survey is currently being drafted. We hope to send it out to businesses next week. And I encourage businesses, if they haven't received uh, an email from us, to contact us and we'll make sure that we get the survey to them. The second survey is um, an internal survey, and it's going to be a count survey. And so Travis will be doing a simple count uh, on set times throughout the week on the gravel lot as, and other areas around town. Um, in addition, other municipal staff, RCMP, bylaw, FCSS, myself, can also enter stats into this survey. And this way that we can have these set number of stats, so we know that Monday, Wednesday, Friday at different times, um, we'll be collecting the information, and also whenever anybody else has happened to be through that area, when bylaws doing their uh, patrol, when police are being, doing their patrol. And so we can kind of get an understanding of the flow of that lot, of that specifically the lot, um, the gravel lot, as well as other areas around town. And this count will begin in July and run until early August. The thir third survey is a demographic survey. So Travis will meet with individuals who live in their vehicles and try to understand their unique situation. He'll ask them if they're working or if they're traveling, the time they spent in Canmore, resources needed, uh, do they practice no trace camping, and similar questions like that. Anyways, so without further ado, let me introduce you to Travis. Travis comes with us with a wealth of statistical experience. He's a PhD candidate in public policy. He holds a BA in psychology. His experience includes volunteering with, at the Distress, Distress Center, teaching policy classes, and graphic design. He currently lives in Canmore and has a young family. So please join me in welcoming Travis. Um, Thank you. Sorry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, Lisa has done a very good job of summarizing who I am and sort of what I'm looking at. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm very happy to have the uh, chance to be a part of the community and, and inform the decisions that council will be making subsequent. Um, I do have a, a young daughter, she's four months old, 
And this gives me a chance to sort of be more involved in the community and be a part of the environment that she would be growing up in. So I think it's, it's quite admirable and uh, it's an interesting opportunity. So thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, I don't think, did you have a question? Councillor Stanford. Thank you, Risha. Um, welcome. Thank you. Um, I thought I heard Ms. Brown say something about um, speaking to people who were not on the, on the site, are you gonna, you're trying to find people throughout the community yeah. who are living in their vehicles? Yes. And so what is your strategy for doing that? Um, so we'll like, do you want people to call in and say where they are? Because I know a few right now where they are, if you want me to tell yeah. you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a couple strategies I'm sort of looking at. And we're sort of, it's, it's not early days, but one of the issues that I'm not going to be knocking on door to door and sort of rousting them or, or going in. I think what it is, is going to be a word of mouth and a snowballing thing. So we have community liaisons that are sort of, we'll be introducing um, myself. We're going to put a video up so that people know who I am and give them opportunities to contact me. Um, I've been in discussion with some of the local businesses that have encounters with them, passing my contact information out. So it'll be a little bit of me going out into the community, going out to um, the space behind Save On Foods, later in the evening when the um, van lifers, campers, residents move back in, come back in, and then sort of establishing a protocol of that. And it will be, I will be emphasizing the fact that I'm here to give them a voice, like so they can have a voice. They can come back and tell us who they are, what they're doing, why they're in town, these sort of things that will help us inform decisions and help council inform decisions. So it gives them a degree of agency and, and I think it's just a matter of making that, bridging that gap, sort of the strategy. So it's a little bit of my presence out in the streets, um, word of mouth through people that are actually have already talked to, that sort of thing. So it's, it's not, it would have been different if we'd been collecting data before the bylaw had been put in place, um, but they were centralized in a smaller location. After that's happened, they now disperse throughout the community and it's a very hit or miss. So sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. Um, they'll be moving around. So right now we're just trying to determine, I mean, beside of what I said, you know, if there's better ways for us to actually collect the data and, and interview people. Um, there is some discussion about putting it online. Uh, that lacks a degree of restrictions that I think we need in security in terms of what the responses we're going to get. So right now it's a bit of a moving target. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, you bet. Um, so currently if people are being Roasted out at 7 a.m. You're mm -hmm. not part of that then. It's just by no. They would be because I'll be going oh. in the evenings. No, in the morning though. Oh, and because the park because the parking there's no parking there at 7 yeah. a.m. Right. So if if people are being moved at 7 a.m., you're not part of that. No, but no. I'd be going there earlier. So oh. I would go in, go in around 6 6:30. In the morning. Make it make a discussion, make my presence known, and then say I'm available throughout the day. So I'm not going to be conducting interviews that early in the morning. I don't want to be part there, so I don't want to be infringing on bylaws' ability to enforce right. um, the 7 a.m. move out. I just simply want to make my presence known and give them the opportunity to sort of contact me as they see fit. Um, I just don't want to be in a situation where there's tensions depending right. on where they're moving out no. or what the situation is, but just make my presence known. Okay, so bylaws doing the 7 a.m. monitoring and you're doing something yeah, comparable. I mean, I will be doing counts and I'll be doing monitoring and we'll be doing throughout the day determining the best times to go in to see who's there, who's not. Um, just sort of anecdotal evidence suggests that we'll be going there later on in the day uh, and sort of moving forward from that. But, but I'm not going to be trying to do any interviews at, at, at that right. point in time. So. Okay, great, thank you. I missed uh, understanding when, when it was that you started. In the Last position? Monday. A week ago yesterday. Yeah. Because there is a lot of anecdotal information floating about the community. I'm really looking forward to having something that's more dependable than anecdotal. Mm -hmm. and, and I expect that's part of what we'll hear from, from you and through the process, um, n including uh, more informed uh, information, informed opinion around the uh, displacement of, of people that have been camping in that location into other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, we've always, experienced that, I mean, historically, and I'm not sure that the incidence is, is that much greater than it has been in past years, but because of the focus that's been placed on what was happening on the uh, parking area behind Sabon, I, I think 
I think the community feels there's more uh, campers in, in the neighborhood. So if we have more informed uh, information on, on that aspect, that'll be helpful. Mm -hmm. The, uh, I'm curious if, if we've heard anything from the owners of Home Hardware. Good question. Um, so I did chat with uh, the manager of Home Hardware and they, uh, last week it didn't seem so, like there was so many people moving over. This week it's more, even actually in the last couple of days. A couple of days ago I went and I uh, uh, went through the area about 10 o'clock at night and I noticed more people were moving onto the gravel lot. Uh, but then last night I saw that there are lots of individuals in the Home Hardware lot. So it is impacting them. Um, and we will continue to work with them to see what we can do uh, and to work with bylaw as well. Is there a, some agreement between the town and the owners of that property that, that they would keep that laneway open? So home hardware, from what I understand, they only have, um, they only lease 24, 25 meters off the back of the property. So then it now it goes to um, the property owner. So I think our next step will be uh, reaching out to Pika, who is the property management for the owner, and seeing if we can maybe um, discuss how, how we can uh, alleviate the impact on the business. I guess the, did you have something you want to add to this? The, the thrust of my question is, if I was the owner of the home hardware, that, that really bumpy parking area, Mm -hmm. I might be tempted to put a chain across, you know, between the uh, panhandled area and, and that property is, but is that something that they're able to do or? No, because that's not the property that they lease. It's only the 25 meters back from their, their um, building. What they have said is that there's, um, there's less and less parking for their customers. So originally what had happened is people, businesses, like the provincial building, would park on the gravel lot that's um, right behind the home hardware that's not municipal land. Uh, and now they're more parking on the paved lot. So we're just discussing that we don't believe that there is any kind of formal agreement that says the access must remain open. Uh, so I which I think was one of your that, questions there. Was, there. Yeah, because yeah. I'd heard that somewhere, and I just didn't know yeah. if it was true or not. Yeah, neither of us are aware of that. And that would have happened just since the opening of Elevation Place, so neither of us are aware of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one last question I have is just around the, uh, the business survey that you described. How are you distributing that? Uh, we're going to be working with um, the manager of economic development, uh, Eleanor McClett, and uh, and going through the um, downtown business, uh, business uh, chamber of commerce, and their email lists. So basically, you'll be emailing the survey directly to each business registered. Yes, that's Great. right. Councillor McCallum. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, receive a copy of the contract between the town of Canmore and the Wapiti Campground. Okay. And I note that that uh, contract is um, up at the end of the year and is open to renewal, but we also know that the provincial government wants to take that land potentially back as well. So, but we have a new government. Um, my question is, is that has there been any discussion with the managers of the Wapiti Campground to see if there's some sort of agreement that could be made over the course of the rest of the summer uh, with regards to reduced uh, camping fees for vetted through people the same way we do the affordability services program? Um, I would note that living in Spring Creek that there's uh, some of those campers have actually moved into Spring Creek as well. Not many, but some. Um, but Spring Creek is always busy regardless. Mm -hmm. But yeah, my question is about um, the Wapiti Campground and if there's an opportunity through the course of the summer uh, for either businesses to purchase these for their staff at a reduced rate or if something through the affordability services program or something mm -hmm. like that. And I'm not sure if that's a question you can answer today, but... It is a question I have. 
Uh, so the manager of public works, um, Andres Como, Mr. Como has been in contact with Wapiti. So we meet once a week on a Wednesday to talk about um, uh, what each of our findings are. So I haven't yet uh, spoken to Mr. Como about um, about what his conversation with Wapiti was, which I believe was just last week, but we'll have more of an update after that conversation. Uh, I'm not sure if we're exploring yet exactly what recommendations we should be putting forward, mm -hmm. but instead we're exploring possibilities of recommendations. So really what we want to focus us on is understanding the demographics and understanding yes. the needs, and then it would help um, us be able to um, bring recommendations and also the impact of those recommendations to council. And I totally agree. It's almost like you need to get this information, which could be a potential recommendation to sort of shore up while you're going through your demographia and et cetera. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know if that's something that had been thought of. And I'm also curious if other provincial campgrounds or private campgrounds have been consulted as well as to their willingness to partner with the town on these things. And I don't know if we have people who are camping in um, provincial campgrounds as it is, working in town, I, I don't know. I wish you luck on that business survey. I'll tell you that right now. Big luck. Hmm. Luck? Luck? In, luck. In what way? I'll just leave it there. I just know what, how much luck uh, the contractor had with regards to working with the business community, trying to find um, information regarding who was providing staff accommodation and who wasn't, both yeah. in Banff and Canmore for the housing needs assessment. And there was, um, it was very, very difficult. And as a result, there's no information in the housing needs assessment and data as a result so of that. By luck, you're referring to? I'm being slightly facetious. Yeah, but you're talking about getting um, fulsome, yeah. fulsome information. Yeah. And it's also go time for businesses too, right? Uh -huh. so. Yeah, it is. Um, are there, Thank you. there are other questions this time? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your name. Travis. Travis. Reynolds. Reynolds? Reynolds, R-U-I-N-O-L-D-S. Well, it was very good to meet you, Travis, and thanks for being here. And uh, thanks for being here as well for the, to give this report. Uh, yeah. It's early days yet, but, but it's been encouraging to see how things have changed from from since the time council made that decision early May, wasn't it? Yeah, it uh, was early May. Yeah, we all know there's a lot of work to do, and certainly the information that Mr. Reynolds will be gathering will help uh, council with decisions later in the year as to what the next steps might be. So, looking forward to Thank learning you. learning more. Uh, so we are planning to come back in the fall with our recommendation or with um, the data that we're collecting. And uh, before I end, I was just hoping to um, really encourage anybody who wants to reach out to Travis to reach out to Travis and to encourage all residents to have patience with this process. It is, uh, I know it's very complicated and there's lots of emotions uh, attached to um, either where your beliefs lie, but um, thank you very much to Council for letting us, giving us this Base to collect the information and uh, and hopefully then we'll be able to have uh, more data to be able to look at better recommendations. You know and to that that point I've, I've spoken with a number of uh, residents who were quite upset uh, a month ago and have acknowledged just in the last week that to their surprise that the decision of council is proving to be uh, beneficial to, to improve situation. So I think uh, the, the general sense I'm getting from members of the community is that, that we're on the, right, um, on the right path here. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I think we have time to move into item E1, council updates. And the usual format, if anybody has a question for anybody else, hit your button. And it looks like there's no questions. We'll move on to item F, F1, service area reports. Any questions regards, uh, in regards to the CAO's office, uh, section A, Councillor Comfort? 
Oh, you're jumping the gun, are you? Well, general manager of municipal infrastructure. Yeah, that's part of section E. Off you go. Um, so I was just curious the, about the charter challenge to a tourist home bylaw. I wonder what the what was the basis of the argument? As short as you can possibly make it. I am also somewhat com curious and confused on that one. Uh, so there was a concern around sufficiency of disclosure, uh, but ultimately the charter challenge, the sole ground for that was um, a Supreme Court decision that they called Jordan, which is the Jordan law, which is the time period allowed under which um, a prosecution must take place. Otherwise, it is considered to be too long and therefore void. So that was the primary point of the challenge. Thank you. Questions for Section B, Municipal Services? Uh, I, I have a question in regards to the report on the Bow Valley Food Alliance, Family and Community Social Development. So the FCSS is, is only the fiscal agent for that grant, is that right? That's right. Right, so Food Alliance is doing some work and they require to have a municipal body being the, uh, the agent. Correct. They have to have a charitable, a certain kind of status to get the grant. So it's likely that that alliance is not um, a, able to receive the grant. But as we are a partner of the alliance and work closely with them, it's a natural fit. Great. Thank you. Anything on rec services, fire and rescue? I have a question under fire and rescue. The first item work continues on procuring sprinkler protection trailer. Do we know when that trailer will be in house? Haven't heard. No, we don't yet know. Are we, do we think it's gonna be soon? We have, we do not know. Do not know. Once we know, we can let you know. Okay. And hopefully it's here before the fall. And a, and a sort of a sidebar question. Have you heard any um, uh, discussion at uh, Fire and Rescue around the possibility of uh, wanting to have another unit or more than one unit overall? No. No. Might be a good conversation to start. So they, they have budget for one. I know, this year. And next year. In the, in the two-year budget cycle, we have a budget for one. Okay. In the long run, I think maybe more than one would be worthwhile. I mean, I think there is, um, th there's prob this is probably worth a longer conversation. There's a whole lot of issues associated with that. First of all, setting them up requires a lot of human power. Um, then, then they need to be stored, they need to be regularly tested. And I think there may be a false perception that we can rim the perimeter of the community with them and everything will be fine. Um, that is not the case. So I, I was at the test and when they're going uphill, they're not particularly effective and don't go all that far. So they're very effective for certain places and certain neighborhoods, but we could spend a lot of money rimming the entire perimeter and I'm, I'm not sure that would be money well spent. So I think the fire department feels like, and I, I will confirm this with Chief Gaylor and let you know if he sees it differently. He's probably watching right now and will email me before I'm done talking. But the, um, they're, they're quite happy to receive one and to test it and trial it and use it and roll it out in the community and then determine if more are needed, what that would look like. But I, I don't think they're right to the point yet that we already need more before we have the one we've purchased. Okay. Ms. DeSoto. And, and just to add to Ms. Cottle's um, comments there, I, I think yeah, in the pilot, at least what I witnessed as well, is that much of the struggle um, was with the water infrastructure system, not necessarily the fire hose laying and, and the manning of the, the sprinkler perimeter system. So the ability of our water distribution network to protect multiple areas at once and have the pressure to be able to do so um, without 
completely draining our reservoirs, for example, and being able to uh, allow people to, to use water in their homes um, can be problematic. So mm -hmm. that needs to be tested and managed very mm -hmm. carefully. Mm -hmm. My recollection that from, from that day when they were doing that, or the day I observed the testing, there was a suggestion that what might be needed is an additional pump to increase the pressure. Is that right? Um, I, I didn't receive any report from that, but uh, as you know, that was just in one area of large yeah. or in a distinct zone. So there's various pressure zones around town. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, if, for example, we had a fire coming from the west, you know, you would have to um, decide which zones you were going. You would not be able to, to protect the entire town. No. You just, we wouldn't have the water supply to be able to I do that. I understand that. that. Um, I, but the, the, one of the sites that I toured was up, up in Silvertip, and it seemed that the equipment didn't have the, wasn't able to pressurize the hose enough to get the water up yeah. to the top. Yes. Right. Right. But I thought I understood the discussion to infer that by adding an additional pump at the beginning or maybe along the line, yeah. we could. Well, and that, that's part of the trialing, right, right. and the piloting. I, I know uh, one of the areas tested was my area in Larch, and the issue was collapsing pressures in the downtown area. So as you were drawing water towards the Larch area to, to fill the perimeter system, there was low pressures being experienced in other places in town. So just being able to manage that, monitor valving, et cetera, it's a complicated process. Okay. Yep. I'll be patient. Uh, I can just add... Um, they, there was a pump at that silver tip location. I think you may have been there the first day and then they set up there again the second day and did bring in an auxiliary pump to help with pressure. So I wasn't there the day you were. It was my understanding that the water, it was more successful on the second day with the second pump, but still not necessarily as much pressure as they would have liked. So the pump was brought in and was helpful um, with mixed result. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Well, we'll see what happens when we get the unit here. Uh, questions for from council for under rec, fire rec services, fire rescue, protective services. Anything uh, up to corporate services? Seeing none. Any questions, comments under under corporate services? I certainly have a, a comment, which is yikes! <laughs> One hundred and five. <laughs> Vacancies filled and onboarded since January of this year. 105, holy lifting. Crazy. No wonder I don't rep recognize anybody out there anymore. Uh, any questions uh, under municipal infrastructure? Councillor Comfort. Um, yeah, I just have a question about the work for the, because um, it's just down the street from my house. <laughs> Uh, the completion of crossing improvements on Ronald Drive at the intersection of Ronald Crescent. Um, and the tender closes mid-June, which is, has that closed now, that tender? It did. I believe it closed on Friday. Oh, okay. Yes. So we haven't really had time to look at that. Did we get some bids or? We certainly did, okay. yes. And yeah. then, um, it sounds like things will be fairly disrupted there for a while. That's a pretty big scope of work. So have we done anything to think about mitigating uh, towards downtown with traffic backups and all of that stuff? So each project comes with a traffic management plan that looks at the impacts and the disruption. Uh, so I can't speak to what the specific plan is for this project, but I am confident that there is a plan in place that is contemplating the disruption and how to best manage it. Okay, and then do we have any idea of how long that will take? Uh, I do not know off the top of my head. I can get uh, engineering to provide you with a response. That would be great if you could. Inquiring neighbors want to know. Inquiring neighbors. <laughs> yes. Actually, that would be great to have that, that project done. Make oh yeah. Big difference. And yeah. is this the one that was so long delayed that we initially were gonna? It is right. Yeah. Um, no. So this is. 
I'm not sure which one you're referring to as being delayed. There was previously a plan uh, from a couple of years ago to do improvements essentially along the Boat Bridge Corridor. Um, that is not this project. Uh, so this is a uh, scaled back version of interim uh, work that is being done. Th that's right, to j just do some improvements. Um, my understanding is that that work actually, when, when, in reference to schedule, uh, is that it is intended to be implemented this year, this summer, so prior to the end of the construction season, which would be October. Uh, a question under engineering services. Um, just explain to me what a, an, an, what a standing offer agreement means. Anyone over there? Yes, so a standing offer is different than uh, an RFP in that you, when you do the procurement, uh, you indicate that the nature of the work will be going for an ongoing period of time rather than for a specific project. So you sign what's called a standing agreement and that allows you to provide multiple pieces of work to the same contractor without having to go back and procure each time separately. So it's a more efficient way of, of doing the work. Uh, in this particular case, what it does is we go out uh, for the procurement, we'll have a number of firms apply, we will shortlist and we will sign the standing offer with three firms and then because it's like a pre-qualification process essentially. And then those three firms will have the opportunity to essentially to bid on the work on a going forward basis, Great. rather than trying to requalify and redo the tender for each individual project. Great, and, and that lasts for three years, but in any, can the town go outside of those three engineering firms on any project that we want, or are we committed to those three firms on all projects? Why don't you guys just leave your lights on over there? So if there is a project that we feel that the uh, selected firms are not suitable for, then yes, we always have the option of going out and doing a, procu a procurement for a specific project. There is no guarantee of work by the signing of the standing agreement. Okay, thanks. There's a reference to the Legacy Trail extension. Well, uh, and I walked past there this weekend. It looked like things were happening. It, this notes construction resuming in June. Do we know if that's? Nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Nothing is happening yet. Uh, this is the project that uh, defies completion. <laughs> so every time we think we're getting close, some new constraint uh, uh, appears. Most recently, it was Transalta needed to do some maintenance on their water lines. Uh, and the lines were therefore not pressurized and we could not do the work until they had completed their work and repressurized, but that has then affected the schedule of our contractor and his ability to mobilize. So the short story is it is an ongoing saga and we will continue to update you as it progresses. Um, everybody is very much looking forward to getting that project complete. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and under public works, the first bullet notes the town of Canmore submitted a letter of interest to Alberta Innovates and the Municipal Climate Change Action Center for their Municipal Community Generation Challenge. Is there a specific project that, that we have in mind with that grant application? leave your light on dude sorry uh, so the, we have done some early exploration of the possibility of a micro generation facility essentially not rooftop mounted but actually like a community solar uh, and so it would be to explore the feasibility and the ability to implement an actual community solar power we, we are in discussion with biosphere on that yes so we've talked a bit about that during previous discussions around climate action plan. Yeah. But, but so this application is, uh, it's very specific to the one project. It's just not sort of a blind, let's hope we get some money and figure out what to do with it. Generally, no government offers and we do not apply for anything blindly. So huh. this is for a specific project um, uh, and with around those parameters. Great. And um, 
the Centennial Fence Project, which is mentioned in the Public Works, was awarded in May to ISL. Do we know when they're going to build it? Uh, the uh, let me just see here. You'd think they would include that kind of helpful information in the update that they would provide. Uh, I know it's been tendered and awarded. My understanding is that uh, it was after uh, the Folk Fest, so they were not planning to interfere with the recreational activities planned for the summer, so I believe it would be September. Okay, great. And I will leave my light on now. Thank you. <laughs> and the last comment I have is just a note on the uh, public art call for the exterior wrap of the new large community food waste containers. I think that's great. Good call. Yeah. Uh, that's all I have. Is there anybody with other questions? Councillor Comfort. Um, yeah, that was based on uh, a recommendation came from Banff because they didn't address it. So they said if you want to head off trouble you should do that because their containers were not very pretty um my question had to do with service disruptions there's a note that this was the most challenging year for frozen services with a total of 111 incidents occurring between january 19th and may 10th so i'm presuming that's 2019 i actually left my light on that time just for the record you turned, you turned it off <laughs> Uh, that, that is correct, yes. <laughs> and um, so it could be the absolute worst if we presume there would be some incidents of frozen pipes going into the fall. That, that is correct, yes. Uh, and it. Although generally they tend to manifest around. In the spring. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, and there's not really anything we can do about that preventatively. Or is no, no, so I mean, EPCOR has uh, gone and taken a look, and there are some places where they have done additional work around the manholes uh, to provide essentially better insulation or uh, looked at the depths of where things are set. But given the valley floor uh, and the high water table, we have a number of challenges. So essentially, no, there's nothing we can do preventatively um, aside from keep burning more carbon so that the climate warms sooner so that it's less cold in the wintertime. And then we'll get a, of course, nuclear oh, winter. We'll get a nuclear winter, and then it'll get, no. get worse. Uh -huh. Thank you. Now my light's on. Mine's been on. I've left your mics on there, so. I'm not, I'm not touching the light. Are there any other questions at this time? <laughs> Seeing none. Um, We'll move on to the council resolution action list. Are there any questions or comments on that? I see none. Uh, the monthly bulletin, bulletin from Bow Valley Regional Housing. Uh, just one question for Councillor McCallum, if she's able to answer it. The schedule notes that you're expecting to be ready to start demolition in June. Is that still your expectation? They've actually started. Have they? Uh, they have to deal with um, abatement of asbestos and so in particulate so they're dealing with that right now. Um, they had to there was still quite a bit of the older furniture in there that needed to be gone um, and they are working with Clark Builders and Marshall Tittimore right now to design the new lodge. It's still not a hundred percent certain that we're getting it. Hmm. Um, uh, money so uh, and money. Huh. So uh, we had always identified that we thought that the budget that they were providing for their building seemed a little tight and sure enough it's a little tight. So uh, we're moving along as though it will happen um, but I will know more at our next meeting, let's okay. put it that way. We didn't so, have a meeting this um, past week because uh, we couldn't get quorum together, so that's why okay. there's a lack of information. But uh, you know, I had coffee with Ian a couple, a week ago or so, and he told me. So we're still trying to sort of uh, deal with the scope, or they are trying to deal with the scope, and in terms of an operator, that also, um, like if AHS is the operator, then the cost of the facility is like 
bomb shelter built, whereas if it's a contractor like Bethany Care or whatever that operates some of the facilities um, east of here, then their requirements are a little less built up. But the problem, the, the 16 million the com province committed to, that's still on the table? Still on the table, it just may not be enough. Right, okay. And the demolition has actually started inside and yeah. do you know when the building will come I down? I don't know. No oh, I don't know any of those things yet, Your Worship. Oh, okay. The inside is probably the biggest part, yeah. to be perfectly honest. Right. Um, so yeah. Okay, just curious. Thanks. No, I completely understand your curiosity. <laughs> And I think we must be coming close to the end. The reporter's just put her cap on. Go time. Editor. Uh, yeah. Well, today she's a reporter. She's special service. Editor's fly. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> okay, with that, I will move the committee of the whole be adjourned. Those in favor, opposed, we're adjourned.